Three, two, one. <laughs> What's up, guys? Zach Evanish here with another Strong Life podcast. I have not done a solo video podcast like this for a while and figured it was due time to crush this. We've got a Q&A on tap today. Got some real solid questions with a blend of training, business, and life. I want to thank my bro squad over at Sorenex.com for partnering and sponsoring the Strong Life podcast. Make sure you check them out. They are the best in strength and conditioning equipment. I've been purchasing equipment from them. It, they were my first squat rack out of my garage. <clears throat> that was the first squat rack. I had it with a custom color. I had a little bit of a customization done on it with regards to the height because I was in a low ceiling garage. And uh, my previous gym before this, which I recently uh, shut down and exited that partnership, phew, uh, I had two XL racks, which are really some of my favorites. And then now at my uh, Manasquan Underground Strength Gym, which is the one and only now Underground Strength HQ, uh, we've got dark horse racks and I got them put together with uh, monkey bars. It's a little bit tight in my gym because of the space. And so um, we have like some weird configurations in my gym where uh, there's the wall and then there's like a section, a segment of a wall that sticks out a couple of feet, which kind of screwed up where I can put squat racks. And so, well, ultimate goal, been talking about this for a long time. And my buddy, Johnny Wellborn did a home gym podcast with, uh, on their podcast with my bro Tex and John has two, uh, base camp sore neck squat racks. And he's got his own building in the back of his uh, property. And I think that's the ticket is you need property. So food for thought for me and for some inspiration. And uh, if you're new here, welcome aboard to The Strong Life. This is your first time we talk about how to get strong, not just in the gym, but how to take those lessons from the gym, from the weight room, and to apply them to your real life. And I'm going to tell you, I cannot stand weak excuses including my own. So when I have a weak excuse, I want to just punch myself in the face. But uh, today's Friday and I've had a great week of training. I actually trained Monday through Friday. You could sometimes see the training that I do on my Instagram at Z Evanesh or the YouTube, same thing, Z Evanesh. Um, but most of the time I'll feature what I'm doing with, with the athletes and whatnot. So that's it guys. Also going on right now, <clears throat> as I'm recording, I've got Operation Thunder Part 2 um, being uploaded into my Vimeo account, and I've upgraded. That is the business course that I created for coaches who want to open their own warehouse gym, their own garage gym, and kind of go with the philosophy that I utilize, which is the low hassle, high profit. And if you become a strength and sport performance coach, go through my SSPC cert, you get a bonus which is Garage Gym Godfathers. That's a uh, business seminar we recorded that I did with my buddy, Joe DeFranco. Um, last order of business here, and then we're going to crush it. Speaking of Joe DeFranco, Joey and I are doing the Lost Secrets of Strength seminar. It's a one-day hands-on seminar where we're going to take you through a warm-up, going to take you through a training session. We're going to have kind of breakout sessions after the training session is over to answer your questions, to do technique analysis, uh, to demonstrate exercises that you might be asking about or conversations come up and you're talking about shoulder health, back health, building muscle, developing speed. We will address those questions through hands-on demonstrating and teaching. And it's not just for strength coaches. It is for anybody interested in being strong and who has a hunger, a desire to learn, which should be everybody. But unfortunately, it's not. A lot of people don't want skin in the game. And I had uh, seen a podcast, uh, a podcaster slash coach, firearms instructor, Scott Volquest. And um, he posted something about why mentors and coaches are important. And he runs classes on uh, firearms training. And I, I think I thought it was interesting to finally <clears throat> see somebody who was kind of speaking the same language as I am. We're both connected through Sornex. And um, I'm actually going to read his uh, post right now. I'll pull it up for you. So just give me a second here, guys. I'm going to pull up his. Here we go. 
I'm going to pull up Scott's post. Okay. On Instagram, Scott Volkorsten. Uh, let's see if I could find this. <clears throat> it may have been on a different post, but uh, he's got two of them. Stand by, stand by. Here we go. Check it out. So I'm going to show you guys here on the video. Hard to see. Okay. Scott says, quote, your squats look good, but unquote, there's a picture of him squatting. He's got a beautiful setup from Sornex. Damn. You know, that's the problem with Sornex is it's always awesome. So you have your own and then you want more. <laughs> Check it out. Your squats look good, but was the reply I received on a video of a recent squat day. This was followed by advice on how to improve and how to get better. It is for this very reason that I am a big believer in hiring coaches, finding mentors, and surrounding myself with the right people that are willing to tell me exactly what I need to hear versus what I want to hear. I love this guy. I love him already. I had a conversation the other day with at Josh Smith, Josh Smith Knives. Okay, Josh Smith is with Montana Knife Company which I purchased from them a knife for my dad's birthday and father's day little, you know, joint. It was a joint gift. I know I shouldn't have done a joint gift, but it's so awesome. It could, it could handle two, you know, uh, two important days. So Josh Smith talked about how learning through apprenticeship is a lost art. And I couldn't agree more, by the way, I did see that my, uh, Josh and Montana knife company actually did put on an apprenticeship. And that's essentially what I do through the strength and sport performance coach certification. It's what I'm going to be doing with Joe during our law secrets of strength. It's what Joe does with his certification. It's what breath Bartholomew does with his art of coaching experiences. These are apprenticeships. They're intensive learning experiences that can not just transform your knowledge, but can transform your business and ultimately your life. So he goes on to say, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. Books and online resources can be a valuable asset, but in my opinion, it does not replace the in-person learning. There's something special about a subject matter expert being able to analyze what you're doing in person. We live in an age of information overload, which can make it hard to know who and what to follow. Agreed 100% there. I have found for me, if I want to learn something, I'm going to seek out those that have real world experience in working with people face to face, not just through an online quote unquote expert. Living in small town Iowa at times can make it a little more difficult to find the right people, but this is where traveling to events and seeking out the right situations has been a game changer for me. Can it be expensive at times? Yes. However, if you look at the time it saves you, years, and in some cases, decades, it's impossible to really put a price tag on that. And, and you want to know how I agree with that? <clears throat> if you come to one of my certifications, or even go through my underground strength coach online course, which is going to become a certification, I've decided that the testing procedure will be, you're going to have to get somebody to record you coaching other people through a certain amount of exercises, as well as our warm-up model. And I'm going to get to see you coach and teach. And if you can't command the room, if you can't coach great, you don't pass. And then you've got to get better versus, oh, I watched these videos. I fast forwarded through many of these videos. I passed the test. I'm certified. I would rather make less money than let people get by on stuff easy because easy does not transform you. And so when you go through my cert and you put in the time, the effort, and you have skin in the game, you've invested money, time, effort, it will pay you back for a lifetime because you're going to implement those training strategies that are going to make you a better coach that now people stay with you longer. In fact, right now, the underground strength coach cert is $500. The SSP coach starts at 500, it climbs up. $500 is like a member staying with you for two months, maybe three months, but you're going to take something, a blueprint, a system and plug it in. 
it's going to pay you back for years and years and decades. Okay. Just like Scott is saying here, he goes on to say, <clears throat> I consider myself very fortunate to learn our firearm craft through that same style apprenticeship learning. It's just so happened that that teacher was my dad, which meant I was going to get direct feedback, whether I was looking for it or not. If you want to get better at something, reach out, ask questions, and try to get around those people that will level up your skill level. Man, 100% true. And so I commented, skin in the game. This is, you know, average folks, they want free, they want easy, they want convenient, they want special discounts. I've said it for many, many years, 10 plus years now, convenience and excellence do not exist on the same street. If you want convenience, it's probably not going to be cheap. Okay. And if you want something cheap, it's probably not going to be excellent or great. Okay. If you want excellence, you're going to have to invest time and money. That's the bottom line, guys. Get a clue, right? All right. That's Scott Volkorsten. Volkorsten. I just started following him, man. Seems like a solid dude. I'm excited to uh, pick up some solid information from him. And um, let's get this mic a little closer. Now we're going to go answer these questions. We have good questions. I want to thank everybody for posting questions. And because of you, that's what makes this podcast great. You guys grab a sip of water here. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to start from the bottom because I believe those were the first questions asked. Here we go. Here we go, kids. I'm going actually from one of the students I used to coach <clears throat> at the high school that I'm working at. Great kid, Liam Canavan, too. What are your thoughts on multiple training sessions in the same day, along with the right way to program the training so that you're doing it efficiently? So I asked him, you know, what do you mean? Are you talking about, you know, speed and then strength or sport practice and then your strength and conditioning session? He said, I mean, multiple sessions as in breaking up sports, strength training, speed training, et cetera. So there's always a few answers here. Of course, it depends. Now I'm going to tell you what I did at different levels. <clears throat> so Liam was a lacrosse player. I don't think he played football. So in lacrosse, what are you doing constantly during practice? Sprinting. What are you doing constantly during the uh, games? Sprinting. And so in season, I'm not going to pile on sprinting. I'm not going to fill that bucket that's already quite full. The preference is to separate sports from the strength and conditioning stuff or the speed training stuff even by at least four hours for optimal recovery. In many cases, it's not possible unless I'm maybe at the division one level. So when I was at the division one level, we would do our strength and conditioning in the morning somewhere around 7, 8, 9 a.m. And then those guys would be practicing <clears throat> around 3 or 4 p.m. This gave them opportunity, obviously, to go to class, to have another meal or two, usually a meal after their first session, and then lunch. It also gave them the opportunity to possibly catch a nap, which tremendously improves and optimizes recovery and progress, whether it's strength, speed, all basically, you know, the physical results that come from training optimally <clears throat> from what I've read, whether it was Charlie Francis or Satsiorsky, these are people that Liam doesn't really know about, but basically we want to try to separate by at least four hours. If we cannot separate, then we put the thing of importance first, and then we backlog it from there or backload it. I mean, so for example, <clears throat> in a training session, I want to begin with a preparatory phase, mobility, releasing tight areas. Then we go into our speed and our jump training when the nervous system is primed up and ready versus exhausted from some heavy lifting. Then we go into our strength, strength and conditioning, hypertrophy, building muscle, functional muscle building, then get some conditioning in. And so I put it in order of importance. Why conditioning towards the end? Well, if you're weak, your conditioning will be poor. So I focus on power and strength. I train predominantly power athletes, ironically, 
some of the baseball players I train are cross country runners, which in the eighties uh, pitchers were really, I mean, even, I don't want to say eighties, nineties, even, you know, up to recently, there's baseball coaches having pitchers running, you know, two miles, three miles to quote unquote, get rid of the lactic acid in your arm, which is not why a shoulder and arm gets sore by the way. So Liam, <clears throat> if you could separate them, you want four hours. Um, if I can't do it, this might happen at the division three level. <clears throat> I might, they might do a sport practice and then do strength training, right? That's actually what I prefer. I say we're keeping the main thing, the main thing, but then here's what happens. After sport practice, the athletes don't even want to lift. They're done. They want to shut it down. So what we do at the high school that you were at and um, what I've been doing this year it's, and with all this COVID stuff still, the in-season teams train with me first. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. They train for approximately 30 minutes. I take them through a warm-up. I take them through sub-max strength and power training. So I'm essentially getting them prepared for practice so they could walk out there, whatever the sport is, and begin almost full blast. I've prepped them up. Even the baseball team last year, if they had a game and we had half days, so I would be driving, we went to school until like 12 noon or 1145, I would train them from like 1230 till 1250, something like 20, 25 minutes with this power training, some body weight work, some jump training, some med ball throws, some very light kettlebell work, some band stuff. They would do that on game day. So I had a game day training session that basically hyped up their nervous system. So uh, I gave you a couple options there. Optimally, we split them up, but most people don't have the time to do that. And if you are running multiple training sessions in a day, you need to be really dialed in with lifestyle, nutrition, hydration, all the outside factors that uh, can make or break the results. All right. Great to hear from you, buddy. Hope uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what college you went to, but I hope you're doing awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question by Chase Porter. The age old question, volume versus intensity for hypertrophy. To me, Despite the science, it's history and real world applications tell us the biggest guys of each era were the strongest guys who did not do obsessive volume. So he mentions Steve Reeves, Reg Park, Casey Viator, Mike Menser, Dorian Yates. If you look at um, Steve Reeves' workouts, he did three full body training sessions a day. His rep ranges was a lot of like three to four sets of eight to 12 reps. I think eventually you hit a wall with that kind of training, but he was obviously genetically gifted. Hence why he became Mr. Universe. He had a amazing physique, but I think let's say I was training athletes or training somebody for bodybuilding, eventually three to four sets of eight to 12 reps doesn't um, produce change. I need to change something. Eventually full body workouts need to get changed so I could do varied volume. I would do upper body only, lower body only, or maybe a three-way split so I could have changes in volume. What I'm essentially talking about is the conjugate method where we rotate the amount of intensity, the volume, the speed of exercises. That's why they have speed day, dynamic day, and max effort day. Now we go to Reg Park, who actually did quite a bit of volume. He did a lot of the five by five. And if you would see some of his sample workouts, those workouts look like they could have easily taken 90 minutes. And so if you Google Reg Park workout, you're going to see five by five squat, followed by five by five bench, followed by five by five clean, followed by five by five bent over row, followed by, you know, three sets of eight curls and then three set, you know, it was quite a lot of work, but heavy. And so I think the guys that were strong had a different look. Now we go to Casey Viator as well as Mike Menser. Those guys trained together for a bit, but Casey Viator did bounce back and forth between high volume training, doing the body, the typical bodybuilding splits of three or four ways, and, and meaning like uh, chest, shoulders, tries one day, 
legs the next day, back biceps the third day, stuff like that. And so he went back and forth, although he's predominantly known for being a Nautilus uh, high intensity guy because of that Colorado experiment where he gained all that muscle. Although that was not muscle he never acquired before, that Colorado experiment was regained muscle. And of course, um, all of these guys were chemically enhanced, except Steve Reeves, probably not. Reg Park, there's a, certainly a possibility, you know, that he had access to some sort of steroid uh, pill form. And maybe even Steve Reeves did as well, but probably very minimally. The other thing, of course, you know, Reg Park was huge on um, eating lots of steak and uh, drinking lots of whole milk. And he was from Africa. And I think that probably the quality of his food, looking at, you know, his time of competing in the 50s and 60s, even the, that those foods in America in the 50s and 60s were less hampered and tampered with, less, you know, hormones injected into them, less chemicals in the air from pollution, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's hard to compare a steak of today or the milk of today to that of I'm 45 and I'm born in 75. So we're talking 60 years ago. Drinking milk back then was probably very similar to being on steroids, you know, probably very close to being raw milk or most people did drink raw milk. And by the way, a lot of you guys saw me post photos on my Instagram a couple of weeks ago. I was in upstate New York near Cooperstown. And uh, on the way home, I stopped at a farm. I picked up milk. It had cream on top. And I picked up like a full stick of butter. The butter tastes amazing. The milk was awesome. And um, I know people are going to get all bugged out over this. I've been drinking a, let's call it an anabolic shake, where I put in um, three whole eggs, okay? Raw eggs go in. I put in a scoop of protein powder, a scoop of natural peanut butter. That's five things. I'll add water. Or when I had that farm milk, I would add like half a cup of milk and it tastes beast awesome. And, um, you know, so far so good. I've been feeling really good. Okay. And people might ask, oh, are you ripped? You don't get ripped from that. I have not been motivated to be ripped since bodybuilding days. It just doesn't inspire me. You know, I was always inspired by these Reg Park physiques, this thick, rugged look. Okay. Uh, Mike Menser, you know, I've, I studied Mike Menser quite heavily as well as Dorian Yates, and I implemented a somewhat similar approach as I studied Dorian Yates' blood and guts model. I had his VHS tape the first day it came out. I had his book, Blood and Guts. I have Mike Menser's book right here. So those of you watching, I'm going to lift it up just a moment. Heavy Duty, that's the original one. And then this was actually one of the first bodybuilding books I got as a kid, super high intensity bodybuilding. Okay. And this is, is this uh, Ellington Darden who's had multiple variations of high intensity bodybuilding come out, but essentially all of that stuff is one all out set to failure, which most people have not experienced truly. And I, I also don't have the guts <clears throat> to go through with it. Here's what it would be. You know, him, when Mike Menser and uh, Doreen each trained together, I remember a sample upper body day or a chest day. He had him warm up, you know, two sets on the incline Smith machine. Then he had him do like an all out set of like seven or eight reps. Then they did like two forced reps, racked it, stripped some weight, maxed out again. Uh, when he couldn't do any more on his own, he lifted the weight once or twice and Dorian did uh, all out negatives. He was done with his chest workout. Then for biceps, I think he put him on the Nautilus uh, curl machine and he did like an all out set of 11 or 12 reps, a few forced reps, and then he was done. Now, Dorian Yates was on more steroids than a racehorse, as are many of the guys of today. And so you can develop quite an impressive physique when you're so chemically enhanced to each their own. I don't care that people do or did steroids. It didn't bother me. I trained in, in a gym 
with many guys doing steroids. My training partners did steroids. I didn't care. That's their choice. I chose not to. Welcome to America. The America of back then. A little different today. <laughs> had, to, had to sneak that one in there. Okay. So what do I think? I think you need to adjust things. You need to change things up. I certainly personally crave change. I could only imagine that the athletes I train, if I'm bored, they must be getting bored. And so I love the conjugate method, changing up things on the regular. But, uh, you know, going back to it, the strongest guys, I think, always had the best physiques, unless they were just so perfect with genetics, right? Like Flex Wheeler. Was he the strongest guy? No. Was he strong? Absolutely. Absolutely strong. All right. Uh, great question here. When you are training athletes, how do you program enough specificity for strength in their sport so they progress while balancing their general athleticism? I like that question. The bottom line is the specificity. We have special strengths. So if I'm training wrestlers, I could incorporate isometrics. I can incorporate the lifting of odd objects, which gets them strong in those awkward positions that will be in while they're wrestling. I could incorporate certain exercises or circuits that match the time of a wrestling match or a wrestling period. I could also um, do, you know, uh, general, that would be called general specific work. But then I really think it comes down to if you want to improve in sport, you must get great at that sport. And I've mentioned this before. <clears throat> it just, uh, you know, I never know. Um, I never know who's listening or when you come about from started listening. But I've had kids that fall in love with training, but they're not in love with the sport. And so they'll never become great at that sport. And that's been football, wrestling, and sometimes baseball. If you want to be a great baseball player, you need to get great at hitting, throwing, fielding. And the way to improve those things is through general strength and conditioning. But then we have the specificity of the sport coaches. So the sport coach has to be high quality. And sometimes that's a uh, area that the kid, let's say a kid goes to a public school and his sport coach in that sport is not that good, doesn't care. You know, for example, I, I live in this small beach town. And when I moved here, this wrestling team was so horrific. I mean, I couldn't give away my help to the guy. I once saw them lose a wrestling match like 81 to nothing. That's insane. Those are the kind of points that are scored in basketball games. Thank, thank the wrestling gods. They hired a new coach. But um, this coach was so bad that it, it, it wouldn't matter if those kids could bench 400 pounds. They sucked because the coach did not care and the coach did not teach them proper wrestling and did not get them into the whole wrestling life. And so this is also why at Alabama, it doesn't matter really the intricate detail, details of training. Their recruits are the best of the best in football. And so they're going to succeed in spite of the training. That doesn't mean they ha don't have a great strength coach. Um, I know they did <clears throat> their strength coach, um, Scott Cochran, I believe, left and became a um, skills coach at, uh, I don't know if he's at Georgia or Georgia State. Now he's out on um, kind of like a mental health break. And so, of course, wish him the best. Um, but I don't think Scott was really the best strength coach, but he had the best damn players. But it also goes to show you that we need brilliance with the basics. What, who is the best strength coach? Like, what do they do that's so, so special? To be honest with you, I think <clears throat> technique is super important. Exercise selection is super important. But then there's a lot of these other... Um, X factors that come into play. I've mentioned that the skill of the sport is the most important, but then we have what's the camaraderie of the team that can completely uplift a team and, and elevate somebody's performance. What if the camaraderie and the culture is shit that will now uh, degrade and decline everybody's performance. And some sport coaches <clears throat> are not great at leading and building culture. And so now it's like a mess from everything they do. And so the culture of the team has to be in great, in a great place because then everything else 
doesn't matter. What I often tell sport coaches is I'm the strength coach and they will not come and show up unless you tell them it's important because they believe you before they believe me. And they also know that the sport coach has a greater influence over their playing, rightfully so. And so we need um, not so much, you know, sport specific work, which I, I hate that word. We need general specific and special strengths, right? So what are those special strengths? You can, um, I have special strength training by uh, Satsyorsky and Louis Simmons. That was actually my favorite earliest Westside Barbell video from uh, Louis Simmons special strengths. I remember seeing them squatting 30 sets of two to build strength and power endurance. They were using submax weights. He would talk, Louis, early days, I remember our earliest conversations was him telling me about wrestlers doing various med ball slams for five minutes nonstop, or Kevin Randleman going through this barbell complex for 10 minutes, doing three reps on the minute every minute because he would gas out during his MMA fights. And so he built strength and power endurance. And I would also argue he was building mental toughness. I know people don't want to believe that word, but it's true. You're building grit and mental toughness when you implement proper training protocol. Okay. Next question from Nima Palamujenja. Hi, coach. What is the best? I love this question. What is the best way to build physical resilience, especially for younger athletes? Thank you. So I'm going to piggyback on some of the stuff I just spoke about with uh, K. Lars 11, talking about balancing strength and general athleticism. Um, and by the way, uh, on that program design continuum, I had a text conversation with one of my athletes who wrestles a lot. And I said, you should train with us twice a week because he's like, I'm going to come in a lot more and I'm going to train on the weekend. I said, you're wrestling a lot. You should just show up here twice a week because now if you say you're coming three days a week, now you start maybe second day, maybe you're, or the third day you don't go as hard because you're like, well, I already did two days. Plus I wrestled a lot. And so we want optimal. We don't want to pile on more and more stuff. And like Mike Boyle said, fill the correct buckets. Is the strength bucket already full? Move to power, move to coordination and athleticism. What about speed? What about durability? What about mobility, flexibility? <clears throat> what about the bucket of nutrition, sleep? Sometimes you got to send somebody home. So, you know, let's go back to this question or let's start it. Building physical resilience, especially for younger athletes. Let me take a sip of water. I'm not going to complicate this. <clears throat> I think that what builds toughness, and I actually made a video on this recently. I'm going to see if I could find it. I, I spoke about consistency. That's what really makes somebody tough. I've got the video. I'm going to hold it up and, and uh, put it to the mic. Hold on a second. Very hard working. Hold on. I used to think that the toughest athlete, the toughest guy was somebody who was just intense, very hard working. But through the years, the decades of being an athlete, being a strength coach, a sport performance coach, here's who's really tough. Is the guy or the girl who keeps showing up all year long, regardless of whether the chips are in their favor or not, and just puts in that consistent work. The person who is not tough only shows up when it's convenient, <clears throat> only shows up when it's important. And then sometimes they try to cram that work in two weeks before a big event, a big competition. It's too late. You haven't showed up for two months, four months, or all year. You're not going to suddenly, magically improve your performance in two weeks when you haven't been showing up all year. Consistency in work, in training, in life is the true toughness. I used to think that. Okay. <laughs> Shut the book. <clears throat> it's over. That's it. Just kidding, guys. I'm going to keep it going. Don't you worry, kids. So consistency is the key get kids on an, a regular exercise program that challenges them but doesn't destroy them and doesn't you know like at my gym i do at the underground strength gym i now do something called wacky wednesday which is quite tough by the way and i'm gonna see if i have 
a photo of a recent rat wacky Wednesday workout, wacky Wednesday training should not make sense. It should be kind of crazy and wild. And so here's a sample. Uh, hard to see it on the video. I'm going to go through it. So I warmed up the guys. They went through their prep portion. Then we did elevator dumbbell bench, three different angles, three reps each. So you need a partner for that. So you bang out three reps on a high incline, three reps mid, three reps low, or you start low, mid, high. Okay. Then they did pull-ups for max reps. Then they did kettlebell row for seven reps. So we want reps that make no sense. We want to combine exercises that shouldn't be combined. That's the idea of Wacky Wednesday. So they did benching. Then they did pull-ups, which is a vertical pull. Then kettlebell row, horizontal pull. So they did that for four rounds. Then they did heavy zercher squats, one rep. <laughs> it was great. So uh, we had a kid uh, build up to uh, probably something like 350. I can't remember how many reps he did with it. I think he did five reps at 350. That's our boy, Jimmy Barnes, Jimbo Jet. Then they did a weighted plank. So a partner would put weights on your trunk area, a little bit on your uh, kind of like your upper glutes and like low mid back. So you did a 30 second plank. So you did your hard rep, one rep zerger squat, weighted plank. Our boy Jimmy doesn't listen. So I said one rep, he started doing three and then five, but that's wacky Wednesday. You're not supposed to listen. Then they did six iron mics. Iron mics is when you put your hands behind your head and you do lunge jumps. And I, so I guess iron Mike did these in prison and the way it works is every four reps is one. So it's one, two, three, one. One, two, three, two, one, two, three, three. So it comes out to 24 reps of lunge jumps, which is 12 lunge jumps each leg. <clears throat> One time uh, this, this past summer, we had a kid. I've been, I started training him in sixth grade and um, he's in like the uh, ROTC. He's, you know, been trying to get into, uh, I think, Naval Academy, very sharp kid. He's at like an aeronautical engineering school right now down in Florida very sharp kid. When he's down in Florida, he trains with guys that are in these uh, like special forces programs and they did iron mics. I think they did, you know, 10 reps for 10 rounds. It, it was nuts. They did something like 10 curls, 10 pushups, 10 iron mics for 10 rounds. And uh, the 10 curls, 10 pushups, 10 sets came when I spoke to them about my buddy, Joe, who always did a hundred sit-ups uh, he benched every other day. He always did five sets of 10 barbell curl at the end of every training session. And so they were inspired by the craziness of, uh, they, you know, those guys mentally respond to that kind of crazy training. But I'll say this, those are the guys that also have to hold them back and tell them, listen, you're actually training too hard and you're not going to get strong. You're going to, you're always pushing the limit. You're always going till you could barely complete a rep. You don't get strong that way. You get tough, but to get strong, everything's got to look clean. You got to leave a little bit in the tank. You got to be optimal. All right. So um, I hope that helps you on toughness. I just want to see regular training. By the way, I'm going to post some video footage of my son who just turned 13 training. He doesn't train a whole lot. He shows up sometimes every other week once a week, twice a week, it all depends, but he's out at the beach surfing and boogie boarding and, and playing pickup basketball with his friends. And since age two, not even, he started climbing a rope in the garage. Why? He saw me training in the garage all the time. He thought it was normal for somebody to be doing push-ups and sprints and farmer walks and kettlebell training. And so if we start them young, they develop grit. If we wait too long, they get so uh, disappointed in themselves because they can't do one push up, and now they don't get tough and now it becomes tough to get them tough. So I think starting early and being active at an early age is important and consistency is going to trump intensity. All right. Last question I'm going to take. Uh, I got two more questions, actually. Gabriel, my bro, thanks for the help. I got an 18 year old travel soccer player that I'm coaching. He has a valgus knee in nearly all his movements, just his left knee. What can I do to help him remove this so he doesn't injure himself on the field? Tricky thing is it is soccer season. 
So number one, is there any history of knee injuries? Number two, I want to look at the foot and the ankle. Did he ever have a foot or ankle injury in the past where he kind of compensated and didn't put pressure on that left leg? Or is he a, if he is a righty, he's every time he kicks, he's probably taking a strong step with the left leg. So I would do a lot of unilateral submax strength work with this athlete, step ups, um, Bulgarian split squats, walking lunges, uh, reverse lunge, lateral lunge. But I would also incorporate um, those band walks or the hip circle from uh, Mark Smelly Bell to strengthen the glute and the hip AD, um, abductors, abduction. And you could do abduction laying on your side like all old school Suzanne Summers. You could put ankle weights on this kid and do different kind of hip extension exercises to get the glute and the hip strong. So keep me posted. I would probably stay away from jumping and bilateral exercises for now. Let's see if you could go through a six week phase where like every three weeks you're changing the exercises, maybe every two weeks. Uh, it depends on his skill level with lifting and see if you could improve that. One thing I would incorporate though would be isometrics as well. So maybe body weight pause squats in the bottom where he has to hold the position, um, isometric lunges, holding the position. And those isometrics allow you to make corrections to technique. So when your athlete is in the bottom of that position or in the mid range of the position, you could say, stay there. And maybe you have a band attached to his uh, lower leg or around the knee. You are pulling him in into a deduction and he is activating glute and uh, hip to work abduction, abduction. All right. Last question. Mark Althoff. I've been training with kettlebells, sandbags, medicine balls, maces, clubs, atlas stones for years. But I decided to purchase a barbell finally for deadlifts. Any tips to increase deadlift or a program to follow? Yes. Here's my advice always on the deadlift. If you try to kill that deadlift in your efforts to get stronger, it will kill you. Let's say it again, kids. If you kill the deadlift, it will kill you because it is very tough on the back. I would make sure to avoid grinding reps. I would do some basic linear periodization, but lower rep ranges. So I would maybe do... One week I do, uh, you know, I think five, three, one actually would be perfect. So I would get three sets of five on that last set. If five is easy, I would go to eight. I don't know, like to really do rep work on deadlifts. Next week, I'm going to get a heavy five or two sets of heavy fives, maybe a triple. Next week, I'm going to go a heavy five, a heavy triple, and maybe a little more weight, get a double. Okay. And the the deadlift, if you get too close to those heavy numbers on the regular, from what I've seen is it backfires on people. They don't get strong. So I've shared this story before, but again, I never know when somebody's coming in and listening. But I remember when I pulled 545, I was actually training predominantly out of my garage here. And the heaviest I would pull here was 405. I focused on kind of a moderate weight for me and getting speed. And I my motto was like, do a couple sets of a couple reps. So I might do three sets of three, or I might do, you know, five, three, two, one, or I might do a couple singles, but not that heavy and only rest 30 seconds. And so I feel like if you max out or push the deadlift too frequently, it comes back to bite you in the butt and uh, you feel like crap from it. So map it out. Utilize a five, three, one approach to your deadlift. And uh, I think every few weeks from a deadlift, like every three to four weeks of a deadlift, take a week or two off from the deadlift. Same thing with the back squat. Incorporate now the front squat and a zercher squat. So I hope that helps you out, Mark Althoff. Um, oh, I got another question. I don't know how these things, I, I missed them. This is a business question. From Coach JJ495 Strength, okay, Jonathan Yorwitz. When you're a coach and ready to leave one space and lease your own, 
What financial things should you be aware of in that first year? Lease, startup, setup, et cetera. So Jonathan, I covered this when you were in my business coaching group. Okay. That was the strong life brotherhood. I also cover this inside. I'm pretty sure Joe and I discussed this uh, during our garage gym godfathers. I definitely discuss it in Operation Thunder. I'm going to do it now. Even though some of you people don't listen, I'm whispering. <laughs> I'm whispering because I feel like who is out there listening? Some people forget. When I was in my garage out of my first home and I wanted to rent a space, I found out what the rent was, 1500 bucks a month. I said, okay. If I want to rent a space, I need to make at least twice that amount through membership before I rent a space, period, end of story. What I would do today if I was going to open a space is I would have a pre-sale going on. My buddy, Ben Krimis, has a program out on this. I don't know if he still does, but we did a seminar together on it, and it was like the perfect pre-sale to opening a gym, and he does it three months out said three months out, it's heavily discounted pre-sales. Two months out, we're at, I don't know, maybe a 50% discount. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a 40% discount. So it might go like 50% discount, three months out. Two months out, uh, we're at a uh, 40% discount, maybe 35%. And then one month out, we're at a 15% discount. And then when we open the doors, We've got cash flow from the beginning. You've got 50, 60 paying members ready to go. With regards to equipment, I say you go minimalist and you focus on building culture first and foremost. So maybe you get yourself a squat rack. If I get another squat rack from Sornex, I'm, I would pr probably go with the half rack setup that my buddy Kurt Hester has at Louisiana Tech. You could get the safety spotter arms, although I'm a bigger fan of the straps. It's a tough call, to be honest with you. But uh, I would get a squat rack from Sornex. I'd build your own sleds from tires. Dumbbells and kettlebells I would buy used all over Facebook Marketplace. And I would focus on culture, culture, culture. The equipment doesn't make the people. It's what you put into the place. Photos on the wall the code that you stand for, all of these things that will build the culture. From there, by having a nice membership base, you have earned the right to invest in another product. And so I'm not, you know, so worried about what kind of equipment do I get in the beginning. Um, the other thing is, you know, I try to really encourage coaches to negotiate their lease from a position of power. So I don't think we're ever going to be locked down again, but you could certainly use that when you are negotiating your lease. You could say, listen, Mr. Smith, I don't want to sign a five-year lease. Number one, you've seen what the government has done and might continue to do. Number two, there's a possibility I could outgrow this space. I'd love to start with a one-year lease with an option to renew that lease. Um, my lease is an annual lease. I've always been in those kind of places because I rent warehouse space. If you're going to be renting, um, uh, what do you call it? Like storefront, like strip plaza or in a downtown area, you're going to be paying premium price because of all the foot traffic you're getting, which could be a good thing. But if you're training athletes, you know, and your foot traffic is predominantly, you know, adults and stay at home moms then maybe your niche should be stay-at-home moms. I want to be in front of the, the right people. Um, and so that being said, I'd like to have these kind of one-year leases because I'm also at the point in my life where if an opportunity comes up that's better for my family, um, we will pack up and go. So if somebody offers me a job of some sort, it could be a coaching job, I could be in business development, leadership, if it's great for my family, I would get up and go. That is the truth. And so if I don't, if, if I'm stuck in a lease, now we've got a problem. So just some food for thought, my man. Have a base of clientele already paying you. And uh, don't worry about the equipment. Space, lease, I'm looking at the question. Financial things. And um, what kind of lease do you have? Am I just 
you know, paying the rent and then taking care of my, you know, I know you're in Maryland, so I'm just uh, paying gas for my heat and my electric bill, or am I also doing, you know, are these other expenses going to sneak up on me? So be very careful of that and have the lease reviewed by another attorney who specializes in real estate law. That would be important if there's any sneaky words in there. Because unfortunately, you can't really trust anybody nowadays. Um, trying to see if I've got any other questions. I don't think so. I think we are good. All right, guys. So I want to close out with this. Number one, again, big thank you to my bros over at Sorenex, Sorenex.com. Also want to thank you guys for leaving reviews. I did not, um, by the way, see any of the recent reviews. I am going to check that out real quick right now. And uh, we've got seven spaces left in the Law Secrets of Strength seminar. That's with myself and Joe DeFranco. So make sure you sign up for that. The link is in my bio on Instagram. And uh, cool, we've got, uh, we've got some uh, new reviews. I'm going to see all the reviews here. And uh, those of you that leave reviews, send me an email and I'll hook you up with one year free to undergroundstrengthcoach.com. That's the Underground Strength Academy. And guys, get on the newsletter. Go to zachstrength.com. I'm going to tell you why. Believe I've got 36, 37,000 followers on Instagram. Sometimes I post something and it gets like 50 likes. What the F is that? I mean, I'm sure some of these people, they followed me a gazillion years ago, but that does not make any sense. And I think sometimes if you're not playing the game, whatever that game is, people aren't seeing my stuff. Get on my newsletter. Okay, let's see who gets the gift. Dan C says, thank you, Zach. Refreshing and challenging. Reminds me of one of my mentors, Dr. Ken Leisner. That is an ultimate compliment. Dr. Ken is the man. I have done podcasts and Iron Roots videos on Dr. Ken. Go to my YouTube page at Z Evanish and just type in Dr. Ken or go to my website, ZachEvanish.com. Check this one out. Uh, there's no name. It's just kind of like how Prince used like the, the symbols. Zach Evanish is one of the best in the business. His podcasts are hard hitting, truth bombs, that dive into the art of a coaching program design and business. You cannot find this information in a textbook exclamation point. Thank you. Coach Evanesh for always going above and beyond hells. Yeah, brother or sister. Not sure who, who posted that, but that's beautiful. Um, I don't know if I shared this one, but this is from doc Z E S D. Zach brings the energy and knowledge every episode. He provides insight into the business of strength and conditioning, including programming, finance, and marketing. His stories give insight and reference to his unique style of training. This podcast is a must listen for the strength and conditioning professional. And listen, it's a must listen to for anybody who wants to be strong, not just in the gym, but in life. That's it, guys. I appreciate you watching. If you're watching on YouTube, Please subscribe, like, and comment. If you're on Apple or Spotify, please leave a review. I'm out of here, guys. Have an awesome day, an awesome week. I will talk to you soon.